listen only mode. Hi everyone, on behalf of the AIUM, the American College of Physicians, and the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education, welcome to this webinar on Internal Medicine Point of Care Ultrasound, presented by Dr. Renee Diverzal. During this presentation, participants will learn about the use of point of care ultrasound in the care of internal medicine patients, and after completing the activity, Participants should be able to describe at least two uses of POCUS that can augment physical examination and clinical decision making in real time. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this educational activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Diverstal has no disclosures. During this presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may submit them by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Renee Diverstal. Hello, and thank you for joining me as I discuss one of my favorite things in the world, internal medicine point of care ultrasound. I also would like to thank AIUM, ACP, and SUSME for allowing me the opportunity to speak about something I'm very passionate about. I am a clinical and teaching hospitalist at Oregon Health and Science University and also the co-director for point of care ultrasound, and I enjoy teaching across the UME, GME, CME spectrum. I have no financial disclosures. For objectives, when we're done, I would like for everyone to be able to contrast the use of point of care ultrasound for diagnosis versus monitoring, list at least five applications pertinent to the care of internal medicine patients, and describe at least two uses that can augment your physical exam and clinical decision making in real time. I'd like to start with this review in the Journal of Hospital Medicine by Dr. Sony and Lucas. I think that this provides a nice visual, especially for those who might not use point of care ultrasound or might not understand exactly what it means and why it's different from referral ultrasound. So over here we have our classic physical examination, what us internists like to wax about poetically or non-poetically, um, and we have our simple ask and act all in one time. So I have a patient with hypervolemia and I'm going to do my full clinical examination and try to come up with what I think is going on. However, we all know that there can be limited sensitivity specificity to the physical examination. So we of course have our referral or ultrasound. My patient with hypervolemia, I could send them for a formal TTE. However, by the time a sonographer has acquired the image and the cardiologist has interpreted it, depending on your practice setting, that could be a few hours or a few days. And finally, point of care ultrasound allows us to ask and act at the bedside in a rapid and more comprehensive manner than the physical examination alone. And this is why I love it. I feel like it makes me a better and more efficient doctor. I also want to draw 
your attention to the fact that sometimes we only think about POCUS for diagnosis. A lot of the studies in the emergency medicine literature are on diagnosis of things when the patient comes in with complaint X. So they come in with hypotension and abdominal pain. What is the sensitivity and specificity of point of care ultrasound for ruptured AAA? Whereas there's a lot more to it than that. Of course, treatment, therapeutic procedures, uh, point of care ultrasound guided procedures are essentially the standard of care now. But there's also monitoring. Let's say this patient that I was initially talking about, I couldn't tell his JVP because he'd had neck radiation or he had a BMI of 50. Although BMI of 50 might make my point of care ultrasound study difficult as well, um, the point of care ultrasound does give us additional data points to help say, okay, he's improving, but he still needs, his IVC is still dilated and we still need to take off fluid. And finally, we also can screen for discharge. There is a recent study about B-lines or signs of pulmonary edema. Patients discharged after acute heart failure exacerbations were increasingly likely to come back to the hospital with increasing number of B-lines on discharge. So we, for instance, might say, okay, I'm not going to discharge patients until they have no B-lines, no signs of pulmonary edema, and we've improved their pleural effusions, for instance. And these are the kinds of studies that we need. And finally, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Sony et al. for this excellent textbook, which, while I have no financial interest in, I have recommended to many people looking to learn more about point-of-care ultrasound, and everyone has raved about it. It's a very easy read, wonderful illustrations, and I also thank Dr. Sony for letting me use some of those illustrations in my lectures. Talk is going to be set up in a case and approach method. So I'm going to tell you about real cases I've seen in the inpatient wards. So I'm going to tell you about real patients I've taken care of and we're going to briefly touch on how you could get those images and what we saw and how it affected management. So case number one, we have a 92 year old man with dementia, chronic systolic heart failure with an ejection fraction of 40 percent, chronic indwelling Foley due to urinary retention from prostatic hypertrophy, and due to that, he has had recurrent admissions for urosepsis. He was admitted overnight with the same, and my resident had treated him with broad-spectrum antibiotics and two 500cc boluses. When we saw him in the morning, he was still tachycardic and had soft blood pressures, was altered as he had been the night before, and she was reticent to give more fluid. So we decided to go ahead and assess his inferior vena cava. Now there are many caveats here, including the ventilation status of the patient. However, I find it to be very useful in the extremes. So here we are, we have either a curvilinear or a phased array probe pointing towards the patient's head. That's going to give us this view of the inferior vena cava entering the right atrium. We have the hepatic vein coming in and entering the IVC as well, running through the liver. And this is going to allow us to assess the width of the IVC. So here we have the ultrasound image of the same, inferior vena cava running into the atrium, hepatic vein coming down. Here is what my resident was concerned about seeing. She was concerned that he might have IVC over 2 centimeters in width with less than 50% collapsibility with respiration. Now, I don't have calipers on here. I don't have M mode. I'm not measuring exactly, but ballpark, eyeball, this is collapsing less than 50%. And that can be a sign of increased right atrial pressure, which might mean he would not tolerate fluid well. However, our patient ended up having a very thin and completely collapsing inferior vena cava, suggesting that while he might not be volume responsive, he would likely be volume tolerant. And so we went ahead and gave him a couple of other 500 cc boluses over the day. Uh, this was our treatment, and he did have hemodynamic improvement, and his mentation slowly improved as well as we treated his urinary sepsis. Okay, so on to case number two, oliguria or recurrent obstruction. 
So this is the patient who is a middle-aged woman with extensive uterine carcinosarcoma who presented with failure to thrive, pyuria, and worsening bilateral hydronephrosis. She was taken by interventional radiology for bilateral percutaneous nephroureterostomy, as you can see here, from the kidney draining down to the bladder. So these, they were able to internalize these and she was admitted to our service. A few days later, she noticed decreasing urine output, increasing burning with urination, and increasing urinary frequency while reduced output is noted. And the ins and outs corroborated this. She and her husband were very concerned about possible dislocation or dislodging of these tubes. So we went ahead and performed bedside ultrasound looking for recurrent hydronephrosis. Our scanning technique for the kidneys, probe marker towards the head, and we're going to be in this coronal plane, which is going to give us our kidneys right here under the liver or under the spleen. This is just a view from the posterior aspect, and you'll note that the superior pole of the kidney lies a little bit further posterior than the inferior pole of the kidney. So to give us a true long axis, you often have to rotate your probe marker a little bit towards the back to get a nice long axis view. This is where we would place our probe on either side to get this view. And this is just a highlight of our anatomy. So the kidney, as you all know, is broken up into two components. We have our parenchyma and our sinus. So in the kidney, our parenchyma out here, it's our cortex and our medullary pyramids. So the cortex and the medulla are more hypoechoic when compared with the adjacent liver. The renal sinus is fatty and hyperechoic. One of my favorite descriptions of this, Mike Wagner, goes by um, Sono Internist, um, sonointernist.com. He has a great image on his website calling this like a peanut M&M. So we have the peanut in the middle, the chocolate around the outside, and then the thin candy shell. So this is a normal kidney. The peanut is intact. You'll notice here, this is a transverse view of the kidney, and it looks like a horseshoe. Now here, we're in a little video clip of a normal kidney, and we'll note that there are a few darker pyramids or triangles. Those are actually the medullary pyramids, and they're even more hypoechoic than the renal cortex, but altogether it's noticeable that the um, hyperechoic peanut or renal sinus is still intact, and there's not squishing of the anechoic uh, pyramids together. Here's another clip. This is with a lower powered handheld ultrasound, but it still gives you useful information. This fatty hyperechoic renal sinus is intact, and we see these little hypoechoic or anechoic pyramids up there, and then the rest of the renal cortex. Now this one here, these renal pyramids, I don't see triangles anymore. All I see is gross anechoic dilation and extension all the way out. And so this is an example of hydronephrosis. Now we can grade hydronephrosis into normal, mild, moderate, severe. This would be in the severe range here as it's completely pushing out and distorting the cortex as well as the medullary pyramids. Oh, and again, Dr. Sony also has allowed me to use several of his clips, which is very useful. As we said, you can quantify hydronephrosis into normal, mild, moderate, and severe. However, in my clinical setting as a general internal medicine physician, I'm much more of a, do they have it or do they not have it? Is there hydronephrosis or not? And if there's hydronephrosis, who am I going to consult next? So this, actually, this is our patient's images. So this, we see the kidney is looking more like a horseshoe. So this is a transverse view of her right kidney. This is the liver. And we are sweeping from top to bottom down. I apologize, the speed is a little fast. My clips are set kind of short on this machine. And we're going to see uh, around the, the middle, so we actually see 
hydrourator. So the ureter is large, ureter here is large still. However, the renal cortex actually looks pretty intact. It's not squished out, if you will, too much. So we did this image here, and then we got one of the other kidneys. We, of course, you're always going to get long and short axes. This is the one that with these short clips showed the most. You also can see two different points in time. We can see this little hyperechoic um, tube-like structure, and that actually is the tube within the ureter going down into the bladder. So next, we came here and we did a transverse view of her bladder. So it looked to us like the tubes were in place, and now we're down here in her bladder, and we actually can see that it is indeed full of urine. However, we do have this large heterogeneous mass here, and this is her uterine carcinosarcoma that um, after we showed this to her, she said, I get it now. It's just like how I had to pee all the time when I had my babies. It's like my uterine cancer baby, um, and that was the way in which she and her husband dealt with this tough situation was, was humor, but they did thank us for showing them, okay, we think that this is in place, and we think that this is why you're having some of these symptoms. In addition, this is far above my level of expertise, general medicine. Again, I'm very much a basic yes, no, hydro, no hydro. So I didn't make this decision unilaterally, but me and my med students were able to take these clips, go down and review them with the interventional radiologist who were able to say, yes, we think that everything looks great, and no, we don't think we need to irradiate her with her 30-second CT scan of the ear. So in this case, while this wasn't a decision I made by myself at the bedside, this was the use of point-of-care ultrasound, which allowed us to educate the patient and save some radiation as well. And for her, the treatment actually ended up being fluids. She had really been taking poor PO intake due to nausea. We really optimized her palliative treatments. She got in better fluid, and she started having um, additional urine output. And again, it really was just kind of that security of knowing, okay, the tubes are in place. All right, so case number three, will you staff a Thora, please? This chest x-ray is representative of a patient I had newly met the morning of who'd been on the resident service for about two weeks with severe pancreatitis and increasing dyspnea, tachypnea, and hypoxemia which they felt was due to a right-sided pleural effusion. I love procedures and said, surely I would be glad to do a thoracentesis, but don't go get the kit, don't get everything until we actually ultrasound to make sure that this is a pleural effusion. So to assess for pleural effusions, we need to be posterior because we want to take advantage of that posterior recess of the diaphragm. Here we can see probe marker towards the patient's head. We're going to see either the liver or the spleen and the diaphragm, and we're going to be looking for fluid here above the diaphragm. One thing to note here, this line is supposed to represent these lines, that gravity, of course, unless it's a loculated pleural effusion, gravity is going to be um, making these pleural effusions more posterior, and we have to tilt our probe back far enough to be able to see this posteriorly. So that's just something to keep in mind. So for pleural effusion, we're going to be looking for anechoic fluid collection above the diaphragm. This is the hallmark. We also might see a spine sign, also known as a V-line. So here, probe marker towards a patient's head, so head, feet, this actually is our spleen, and we see anechoic or black fluid above the diaphragm and a little wisp of a lung waving around in there. Interestingly, we also see a little bit of fluid under the diaphragm here on top of the spleen. So this is the anechoic fluid that I'm talking about. We also note what we call the spine sign. It is abnormal to see these vertebral processes above the diaphragm. And that's because air is the enemy of ultrasound and should not be transmitting the ultrasound waves to this and back to the probe. However, up here, or down here rather, the abdominal viscera, the abdominal organs, are going to transmit that ultrasound wave waves down and back up. So here's an example of no spine sign. We have vertebral processes, and then we hit the diaphragm, and there's nothing. 
So this is normal. So we do not see a spine sign here. This is abnormal. This is a smaller pleural effusion. Diaphragm, lung in here. Smaller pleural effusion, but we still see this spine sign moving up. So anechoic fluid collection above the diaphragm and spine sign. This patient has a pleural effusion. The things that we want to look for that you will not see in a normal lung are the mirror image artifact and the lung curtain. So again, uh, this is the diaphragm. It is a curved reflective surface. Air is scattering all of the ultrasound waves. What that leaves us with is a normal artifact, which is the mirror image artifact. And this is very useful. It goes away when there's fluid up here that transmits the ultrasound waves. So this mirror image artifact helps us rule out pneumal pleural effusion, excuse me. The other thing is the lung curtain. So here we have our diaphragm, abdominal organs. The diaphragm pulls down, and we're actually seeing the visceral parietal pleura move in here. So we're seeing a lung curtain pull down, kind of slide that out of the way. So this is normal aerated lung, and I can feel very confident that between the mirror image and the lung curtain that this patient does not have a pleural effusion. So this actually is what I saw in this patient, although this is a spleen, not a liver. So um, our patient did not have a pleural effusion, and actually when we went to his abdomen, he had gross ascites. So this was a patient who actually had compressive atelectasis from huge ascites from his large pancreatitis, complex pancreatitis. So again, no pleural effusion, and that's what we did. We took off three liters, and he had improving oxygen saturations, improving tachypnea, and overall status. Okay, so the next case, will you staff a para, please? Now we have someone that wants to staff a paracentesis with you. So this patient is a middle-aged man with a history of coronary artery disease, status posted cabbage. He has a history of a stroke, hepatic um, cirrhosis due to alcohol, no history of ascites, and more recently has endocarditis. And he's transferred from an outside hospital for confusion, altered mental status, worsening status all around, and just a need for higher level of care. The resident notes that while he is on appropriate gram positive coverage, that he is not on appropriate coverage if he does have SPP, which could certainly be contributing to his altered mental status. So they ask if we can do a paracentesis on him, a diagnostic paracentesis, that is. So this is what we're thinking we might see if we wanted to stick a needle in his belly. However, I personally, with a patient who's never had ascites in the past and had a CT scan two weeks ago with no ascites, I'm not going to go fishing around in the left and right lower quadrants looking for inches of ascites that I don't know is there. So I choose to take advantage of a well-documented uh, protocol called the FAST scan. I am sure you all have heard of it. So the FAST scan, of course, we're looking for um, in trauma patients, we are looking for free fluid felt to signify blood in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and pelvic areas. So I like to think of this for internal medicine as the fluid assessment sans trauma. So I'm not going to fish around, as I mentioned, in the left and right lower quadrants for 25 minutes trying to find a pocket of fluid if I don't see it in the most dependent portions of the abdomen anyway. It's just not worth the time. So we're going to take advantage of the FAST scan and do a fluid assessment sans trauma. Again, all of these positions here for pleural effusion, kidneys, FAST scan, they're all within a couple of rib spaces, so get really good at dealing with these knuckles to the bed, pro marker towards the patient's head. This is an example of a normal. This is a liver. This is the kidney. We have the diaphragm. And this is Morrison's pouch, or the hepatorenal space. In a supine patient, this is the first place that fluid should track per gravity. And there are varying amounts of minimal fluid detection on studies, but I've read as low as 25 cc's and as high as 125 cc's for minimal amount to detect fluid. 
This is an example of fluid in Morrison's pouch. So we see an anechoic fluid stripe between the kidney and the liver here. This is a clip of fluid in Morrison's pouch, and actually this, this is either a lot of blood or some ascites. We see the liver kind of bobbing around in there. So this is a positive right upper quadrant. In this patient, sure, I'm going to go down looking for some fluid to tap. Or if I'm an emergency room doctor, I'm going to send them to the OR. The left upper quadrant is a little bit different in that there is a splenocolic ligament. So the splenorenal space is not typically the first place that fluid will track. So again, we have the kidney. You'll note these little hypoechoic medullary pyramids, um, the peanut M&M &M in the middle, no hydronephrosis here, our spleen, our diaphragm, and also here we have a nice mirror image. This is not anechoic, so in this one view, we can rule out hydronephrosis, pleural effusion, and free fluid. There's no free fluid between the diaphragm and no free fluid between the spleen and the kidney. Here, there's actually a large pocket of blood, and this is why it's really important to always know your diaphragm, your spleen or liver, and your kidneys. This could actually look like a spleen, although it's more hypoechoic, and this is my spleen. So diaphragm, spleen. Subdiaphragmatic space is the first place that fluid generally will track in the left upper quadrant. So I could look for fluid on my patient there, and this would be an example if I did see it. However, we actually did not see any fluid on our patient, neither in the right upper quadrant nor the left upper quadrant. So he ended up avoiding the needle, and we ended up later on discovering that he had altered mental status from worsening of his uh, endocarditis and ended up having a mitral valve perforation despite appropriate antibiotics. But thankfully, we were able to save him and his family another procedure before we figured out where things were headed. On to case number five, what is up with the Foley? This one hits home for me. This is my niece, Ava, and this is my father-in-law, and Ava wants you all to know and agree with me that we can use both our stethoscope and our ultrasound. They are not mutually exclusive, and I think the world, we both think the world would be a better place if we did use them both. So my father-in-law here, this is in January, and fortunately, right after the new year, he presented to his primary care doctor with a couple of months of grossly increasing frequency, nocturia, abdominal distension, and just feeling unwell. They did a bladder scan in the office, put in a Foley, and drained 1.8 liters of urine. He also, at that same time, had hydronephrosis with a creatinine up to 2.8. Thankfully, with drainage, his creatinine did come down to about 1.6, but it never normalized. So this is something that um, I'm very passionate about, as we talked about hydronephrosis before, I think that all of us should be able to rule out gross urinary retention and hydronephrosis. So the reason I got called this time is it was pretty shortly after the Foley catheter had been put in, and he had stopped putting out urine altogether. He'd had no urine out for about six hours. Of course, it is Saturday at 4.30 p.m., he has no sterile saline. They didn't teach him how to flush it. I don't have sterile saline at home, but thankfully we live close, and I had this ultrasound at home as a prop for a photo shoot for another lecture, so I took it over to his house, and I wanted to see what's going on. He noted he had accidentally caught and tugged on the Foley catheter, and he was worried he could have displaced it. So scanning technique for the bladder. As my students say, if it's not uncomfortable, you're probably not low enough. You need to be right over the symphysis pubis in order to not just skim right over the top of the bladder. We're always going to get everything in two views, transverse and sagittal. Okay? This is just an example of how we could get measurements and calculate our own bladder scan. What if this patient had gross ascites and the bladder scanner were picking up fluid up here too? So if you don't believe the bladder scanner, you can always calculate it yourself. This is an example of what had happened to him. Benign prostatic hypertrophy and the prostate bulges up into the bladder and precludes urinary emptying. So I'm going to pause this one right here. So this is a transverse view of the bladder. You see it is right now, um, or uh, rectangular or, or ovoid, we're fanning down from the top, and the first thing we're going to see is a Foley balloon pop up there. 
there's a Foley balloon. So I know that the Foley catheter is in place within the bladder. Then we're going to start to see a very large prostate. So here's the large prostate with the Foley catheter going through it. Again, one more time, sweep from the top, superior to inferior. And we have that Foley catheter balloon and the, the catheter going straight through the prostate, which is bulged out into the bladder. Next, we rotated it. And I apologize for the quality of these images. At that point in time, I didn't know how to offload them. And um, so I, this is my show and tell. Um, so here, this is a transverse. So this is his head. This is his feet. We see that little Foley catheter balloon. And when I sweep back here, we see a little bit of the prostate bulging in there. Uh, this particular handheld model is tough in that you can't see actually what you're sweeping through. So saving clips can be quite difficult to get exactly what you want. This is a still of that. So here is the prostate bulging all the way out into the bladder. And there is the balloon. So what we did, I booked it up to the medical supply store, bought a bunch of sterile syringes, sterile saline, made it back to his house. We flushed it. Out came a bunch of clots and about 600 cc's of urine. So this is the bladder afterwards. It is fully decompressed around this fully balloon. So granted, in the hospital, I'm always going to be able to do a trial of flushing. But when he had called his urologist's office, they had just said, we'll go to the emergency room. So I think that this is yet another thing that we can successfully use to prevent emergency room visits. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Oh, and I should say that he's a teacher. He believes in education and gave me full permission to use that entire story with the hope of, of educating other physicians so that they can help prevent emergency room visits in the future as well. OK, on to case number six. Does his serositis involve the pericardium? This was not a patient of mine. However, while covering weekend for the teaching service, I received a page from one of the clinical hospital service physician assistants saying, hey, do you have five minutes to do an ultrasound with me? And everyone knows that I always have five minutes to do an ultrasound with them. This patient has rheumatoid arthritis, and they have serositis involving the pleural surfaces, so large bilateral pleural effusions, and had an echo about a week ago that ruled out pericardial effusion. However, he's been increasingly tachycardic and borderline hypotensive. The echo techs aren't here right now. I'm hoping that you can just come look with me to make me feel better that there's not a large pericardial effusion. This is one of my favorite images of students ultrasounding, or interns ultrasounding, rather. They're supposed to be practicing their central lines, but this in turn missed the heart day, and so McGregor here is showing her how to do it. So this is what the PA was looking for. She was wondering, does this patient have a gigantic pericardial fusion? The heart's just flopping around in there, and, and thus pericardial tamponade. So how can we tell what's going on? So parasternal long axis. We are going to be in a cardiac preset. I'm not going to go into further detail on this because Dr. Kimura is going to do a webinar, I believe, next month or two on the cardiovascular limited ultrasound examination. And he's an incredible speaker. So I'm just going to keep this to the very basics for now. So we're in the cardiac preset. Our probe marker is towards the patient's right shoulder. And this is how we're going to be slicing through the heart. The parasternal long axis is very appropriately named. And here's what we're going to see. We're going to see our left ventricle, left atrium, mitral valve, aortic outflow tract, and RVOT. Now, you might be wondering why the heart looks like this when anatomically it's like this. Again, that's cardiac convention, and I'll let Dr. Kamura speak more to that. Here's more examples, left atrium, left ventricle, aortic valve, aortic outflow, RVOT. These little lines are just examples that, in a normal heart, these should be about the same size, same width, rather. These little bars should be the same, left atrium, aortic outflow, RVOT. Here's an example of a patient with a completely normal on eyeball test left ventricular ejection fraction. The, in the clue exam that Dr. Kamara will talk about, this is the cardiac dysfunction sign. 
um, and you look for if this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes up within eyeball one centimeter of the interventricular septum. The other name for that, the fancy name for it, is E-point septal separation, and it's been very well validated. So in this particular patient, they are tachycardic, normal ejection fraction, grossly normal ejection fraction, and I see no fluid between the muscle and the pericardium. This patient here has a, this, this whole part here is a left ventricle, aorta, RVOT, left atrium, and we can see that this anterior leaf of the mitral valve barely has any excursion. It comes nowhere near within one centimeter here. So this would be an example of a reduced ejection fraction, or this would be a positive cardiac dysfunction sign, according to Dr. Kimura. There are caveats to this. This could be mitral stenosis, and this could be tethered or not opening. However, um, in most patients, this we would take to mean a reduced ejection fraction. And that's another great example of pathology from Dr. Kimura or Dr. Um, Sony. Okay, now this is going to be our patient, and here we see a very tiny posterior pericardial effusion. So this is our left ventricle. This little anechoic, some people call it the rat tail, it sneaks up over. This is our descending aorta. So this little rat tail sneaks up over. So this is a very small amount of fluid. This back here, all of this anechoic stuff, this actually is a large pericardial effusion. I'm sorry, this is a large pleural effusion. So they have a tiny pericardial and a very large pleural effusion. So at least in this view, I'm not seeing any evidence of um, significant pericardial effusion. Here we have our subcostal view. I'm not going to go here. Dr. Kimura is going to explain it to you all in the next internal medicine webinar. However, this is a great view for the anterior surface of the heart. So I can see a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of anechoic or black fluid there between the RV and the pericardium. However, in this patient, there is so little fluid, I'm not at all concerned that his hypotension is due to a pericardial effusion. Okay, so case number seven and case number eight, we're going to cover these a little bit more quickly because Dr. Bagra and Dr. Blyvis already did a really wonderful lung ultrasound webinar, and I encourage you to go look at the AIUM website under webinars to review this. Also, thank you to Dr. Bagra and Dr. Tierney for some of the images I will use here. So case number seven, our question is directed versus shotgun therapy for acute dyspnea. So here we have an elderly gentleman who has no history of coronary problems, cardiac problems whatsoever, does have COPD moderate on a chronic bronchodilator, and he is admitted for presyncope. He's admitted for workup, including echo, um, carotid dopplers, et cetera, which have not yet been completed because it is Saturday. So he, um, you're down on the floor to go see and staff another patient, and you happen to pop by and see that this patient is looking very dyspneic, sitting up at the side of the bed and quite dyspneic. RT is in there already giving a nebulizer, so you think to yourself, okay, I'll take a quick listen and come back after the neb. And he has crackles about halfway up both lung fields and diffuse expiratory wheezes. So you tell him you're going to go check on your other patient and come back after the nebulizer is done. And when you return, about 10, 10 minutes later, he is no better whatsoever although RT is signed off improved with NEBS. So you go ahead and you go get your point of care ultrasound machine and you want to look for what else is going on. We've already discussed how to look for pleural effusion and mostly I'm curious right now with the crackles, does he have beelines? Is this a sign of acute pulmonary edema? So these are called A lines and again I, I direct you to Dr. Blythus and Bagra's webinar. These are A-lines, so this is normal lung, so this is a rib, this is a rib. This is the visceral parietal pleura, and these are reverberation artifacts here. So this is normal lung, normal aerated lung. It might look like there's not lung sliding, but this is actually my own lung. I know that there's lung sliding, so ignore that for now. Normal aerated lung and reverberation artifacts. And here we have the alternative to A-lines, which are B-lines. B lines start at the visceral parietal pleura. Here's a rib. Here's a rib over here. Visceral parietal pleura, and they are picture them as micro reverberations, all the way, and they carry all the way down. I think of them like headlights, 
or a flashlight sweeping across all the way through the far field. These are felt to be basically microverberation artifacts off of increased interstitial thickening, and they go all the way through. Now, this doesn't have to be acute pulmonary edema. However, in my patient who was fine 20 minutes ago and now has, I didn't mention, but also um, acute hypertension along with dyspnea, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and these B lines, I am strongly suspicious for acute pulmonary edema. Here's another image of these. This is on, again, that lower-powered um, kind of grainier machine, but it still gets the job done. And more than three B-lines is pathologic, and so here I can see more than three B-lines per field. So this would be another one where I would call this um, another name for it. We can call it B-lines. We can call it interstitial syndrome, ultrasound lung rockets. There's a variety of them. So the most important thing here is that clinical correlation is required. B-lines and interstitial syndrome can be from several etiologies, and it depends. Is it focal? If it's focal, it could be pulmonary embolism. It could be a contusion. If it's diffuse, it doesn't mean that's acute pulmonary edema. It could be fibrosis. It could be ARDS. So clinical correlation is required. Just to prove that point, these are both patients that I've taken care of. This is a young man with no medical history besides depression who had a bronchospasm after ECT and developed negative pressure pulmonary edema. And so we obtained this image just for funds uh, with my med students. This one over here is a patient with nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. Some people say, okay, this is a thicker, rattier pleural line, but the B lines still look very, very similar to me. And so the treatment for our guy, this was felt to be flash pulmonary edema due to hypertensive urgency, and he was given furosemide with good effect. And then went on to get an ultrasound the next day, or an echocardiogram the next day. Okay, in our final case, case number eight, but the chest x-ray this morning was fine. So this is a patient I took care of who, interestingly, was admitted for something totally unrelated on the neurology service and then transferred to medicine after she was found to have hokum and needed to have a, uh, a pacemaker or an ICD placed. So she's transferred to medicine awaiting ICD placement, and while she was on our service, she did great, had ICD put in, and had acute iatrogenic pneumothorax afterwards. So we called emergency general surgery, chest tube was placed, and we um, did some ultrasounds before and after. So this is normal lung sliding, and again, Dr. Blyvis and Dr. Bagra's lecture covers this well. So rib, rib, this is visceral parietal pleura, and I apologize for the movement here, this is a med student dimension. So uh, here we have our visceral and parietal pleura are moving on each other, okay? Over here, we have the absent lung sliding. There is no movement whatsoever here. So we are not seeing any lung sliding at all. They also talked about our M mode, motion versus time, depth versus time, rather. This is normal. This is abnormal. Not going to belabor it any further, other than to say that my patient had a perfectly normal one on the right and abnormal on the left with her pneumothorax. It was fun to verify that as well because we don't often see acute pneumothoraces. And um, this is our patient before chest tube. We saw no lung sliding whatsoever. And then after chest tube, we were able to document lung sliding on her. However, when they tried to clamp the tube or put it to water seal the next day, the pneumothorax re-expanded, so it was determined she needed to be to vacuum seal other than when walking for another 48 hours to see if the visceral parietal pleura would sort of adhere to itself. So we examined her after she had just come back from a walk and noted a little bit of worsening dyspnea, and we heard reduced breath sounds on the left again and kind of wondered what had happened. So we re-ultrasounded, confirmed that there was no lung sliding, called CT surgery, and they wanted a repeat chest x-ray just to confirm, even though we said, we're pretty sure that things are not right. Repeat chest x-ray showed re-expansion of her pneumothorax, and on examination, her tube had actually gotten kinked. And so this was just another chance for us to get to use some of these cool things that they use in the emergency room a lot on the wards. Okay, so I'm hopeful we've done all these things. I'm hopeful we've contrasted point-of-care ultrasound for diagnosis versus monitoring. I hope we've shown you at least five, or I know we've shown you at least five applications. 
uh, I'm hopeful that you can describe at least two of the uses that you could go back and put into practice to make real-time decisions. And I also just real quickly wanted to highlight some additional resources. So AIUM, as you know, has a variety of conferences and webinars. SESME has learning modules, curriculum database. There are iBooks. There are the analog books, like the Neil and Sony book I mentioned earlier that I really like. There are podcasts online. The Ultrasound Podcast is a very well-known one. And then Ultrasound of the Week is um, a mailing you can get that has great cases, great descriptions, data-driven. Really enjoy that one if you want it just piece by piece. And then on Twitter, interestingly, this is where tons of people are online tweeting about point-of-care ultrasound. You can see great clips. People will put up new articles. I don't read the emergency medicine literature, but this is where I can find it from the emergency medicine people that also nerd out on ultrasound like I do. So I enjoy the Twitter focus scene. Um, there are simulators, and then there are apps. This is a screenshot of my phone a couple years back, and this is just an example. If you want to use this, Ohio State, Dr. Boehner is, has a great program back there. So you could select aorta, Select the curvilinear transducer. It'll tell you what to do. I want to do the aorta view. And, okay, I'm going to put the indicator over here. So, I mean, my hope is you're not going to be ruling out a triple A with this. However, it is great to have, if you want to get out there and practice on your own patients in the hospital, take advantage of pathology, known triple A's, known things, you can use this to refresh your memory on what you need to do and get out there and practice. And finally, I want to invite you out to Portland, Oregon, where we're going to have this combined AAUM ACP Society for Ultrasound and Medical Education OHSU meeting July 23rd to 24th. And we're bringing in some of the best well-known internal medicine ultrasound faculty in the country. And we really hope to see you there. That being said, I welcome any questions from the audience. And thank you so much for, again, the opportunity to, to do this and also for your attention. All right, so um, I see some questions here. Thanks again for your attention. We're just going to start from the top and, and go down. I appreciate all of your um, the questions and interaction. So someone wrote, let's take the kidney, for example, and evaluate for hydronephrosis. How would you bill it? Focused ultrasound? So I am very sorry, but that is not a question I can answer because at this point in time, at least here at OHSU and as an internal medicine doctor, I, <clears throat> excuse me, see this more as an extension of my physical examination. I do not bill for these things. Um, in the emergency department, I believe that they would bill this as a focused ultrasound. And I do know that there are people that can, hydronephrosis and AAA screening are two of the things that, that others have discussed in these internal medicine lectures, have discussed billing for. It's just not something that I do. And I, um, I think, it would be ideal if, of course, we were all in a place where we didn't have to bill for separate things and just give the best care to the patient. We're not quite there yet. And as people are integrating this in their clinics, they're going to have to think about, how am I going to pay for this twenty to $50,000 machine? Um, so this will be something to tackle, but it's not something that I can personally answer. So I'm sorry about that. Um, this next question, this is a really good one. We teach a medical student elective, <clears throat> and one of the hardest audiences was, uh, included a student who had been a physics uh, a physics professor or a physics teacher in high school. So this is a good physics question. Um, so somebody asked if there were any safety issues of ultrasound um, that we rec the the amount of ultrasound that we use for POCUS. Um, they noticed that one of my um, abdominal scans had had an MI a mechanical index of 1.4. Can this cause non thermal or cavitation bio effects? And that is a fantastic question that I've never been asked before. I've never heard any of the emergency medicine folks talk about it before. And I actually would be kind of interested to, to hear what people think of this at the, um, at the next AAUM point of care ultrasound interest group. I'm, I'm kind of curious about this. I will say that um, unlike a comprehensive examination, when I send the patient to radiology for their full comprehensive gallbladder, right upper quadrant, abdominal scan. These point of care ultrasound examinations, by definition, the entire point is just for them to be quick and dirty in and out, you know, two to five minutes max. I know that that makes a difference for the thermal index and the overall exposure. Um, and I honestly do not know the answer for the mechanical index. And if anybody wants to write in an answer in a question, I look forward to hearing that. But thank you for that question. 
The next question is what are the limitations of point of care ultrasound? And <clears throat> I always try to sprinkle in a few limitations even in a brief lecture like this and I do think it's amazingly important for us all to talk about the limitations. I know when Dr. Kimura gives his clue, cardiovascular limited ultrasound exam lecture, he has some really great um, false positives, false negatives that he discusses for his eyeball tests for cardiac dysfunction, left atrial enlargement. Um, and I think I like to break down the limitations into the, the test I am looking at. So when I'm doing a lecture on kidney ultrasound, I will say, here's a limitation. Kidney cysts can mimic hydronephrosis. However, if you see them, they're walled off and they're not extending down into the renal sinus. So for each particular use, I try to break it down to the, to the limitations, false positives, false negatives for that use. Um, and everybody has a very different take on it. Again, I'm very much basic kind of yes, no, furthering the care of my patients, whereas some of the um, emergency medicine quick care folks are doing amazingly high level things and their limitations are going to be very different than mine um, because they are very subspecialized in that. Um, so thank you for that question. Does my hospital use privileging criteria similar to ASEP guidelines for hospitalists? That's a great question. So we um, are, we currently have in place or putting in place an ultrasound guided procedures one. However, my hospital and many other hospitals don't have anything in place for hospitalists yet. Um, I would say I'm probably the only person actually doing it. And we are structuring after the ASEP, the prac what the, um, this person is referring to is that for the internal medicine people, ASEP, American College of Emergency Physicians, has two different um, patterns. So there is a, you go through a residency program and you, when you finish an accredited residency program, you're deemed to be suitable or, you know, appropriate to use point of care ultrasound. And then there's a practice-based pathway. If you are been practicing for 20 years and you want to learn ultrasound, that you would do, I believe it's 18 hours of continuing medical education, at least half on, and scan and overread 35 images. So that's the ASET practice-based pathway. Also new on the scene is the American College of Chest Physicians. They're coming up with their, they not coming up, they have their own credentialing, um, or rather, uh, licensing certificate, that's the word I'm going for, their own certificate system. And I know Society of Hospital Medicine is also interested in this as well. So uh, my hospital is like many others in that we don't have anything set in place yet. I currently kind of go along with the ASEP practice-based pathway, grandfathered if you will, and I think that that's what we probably will model after, although we are interested to see what happens with the Society of, of Hospital Medicine in there. Um, certif certificate process. Um, sorry, that was a wordy answer. Okay, what probe to be used for POCUS? Doesn't the phase rate probe have poor lateral resolution in the far field giving false or unreliable measurements? That is a great question as well. So I think this is when we're thinking about more definitive measurements, um, more kind of concrete quantifiable information. A lot of the things we're doing that hydro, yes, no. I don't need to measure the ureter. I, these are much more kind of eyeball, gross, yes, no questions. And it could be said that maybe I'll miss something. I might miss very mild hydronephrosis or because I'm not measuring it. You know, I could miss a ureter that's 1.1 instead of 1.0 millimeters. However, the argument back at that is that this is infinitely better than a physical examination of tapping at the costophrenic angle um, for, you know, for like pain with percussion. So the whole point of point of care ultrasound is kind of taking at least my practice of it, take a step back, uh, not worry so much about the, the measurements and the concrete stuff, but add these big picture data points. Um, and yes, a lateral resolution is not as great and there's a variety of new point of care uh, machines that are coming out. So currently on my point of care machines here, we have a linear, a curvilinear, and a phased array. I love the phased array for the chest and the thorax and I use the curvilinear for the other abdominal stuff personally. Okay, so I think that those, oh, here we go, here's more. Um, oh, great, hooray, thank you, Joel, for <laughs> writing back, Dr. Cho, and um, 
writes, generally all POCUS machines have safety preset already, so it's generally considered safe. Um, so the official term is, you know, like there's never been bio effects observed, which is what I had just cruised. Um, and what we all said is that, you know, we still wouldn't use it unnecessarily. The ALARA principle is something that we as point of care practitioners try to do as well. One educational thing we thought about doing was maybe for students in their physiology, GI physiology, we could target the gallbladder and have a student eat a bunch of pizza and live scan. And um, then we kind of realized, okay, we probably shouldn't be sitting there for 20 minutes ultrasounding this person's gallbladder. So um, the as low as reasonably achievable is, is still something that we think about. It's just something I think that we talk about a little bit less. Um, and yes. So that is, um, unless anyone else has any other questions or any other thoughts, if you practice internal medicine and want me to tell everyone something, uh, we're very much trying to get our, our people all together. We've been uh, kind of following and behind a lot of the emergency medicine, critical care medicine, but I really think we could do great things for our patients by practicing and teaching point of care ultrasound and I'm just happy to have been able to talk about it and I think that's going to be it then Kathy <laughs> thank you so much wonderful thanks so much to our presenter for this very interesting wonderful converse, uh, conversation about POCUS ultrasound our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar everyone please remember to complete the post test and the activity evaluation we hope you enjoyed the presentation and will join us again for future webinars so long everyone